Welcome everyone to week one webinar. First, I'd like to apologize for the delay. We had some technical difficulties today, but our wonderful John Pisa was able to sort this out. We're coming live from the Blanket Studio location here at UCF. I am Rohan Jawala, and today with me is Dr. Baiwin Chen. We also have our talented production manager, John Pizzo, who has been very helpful and instrumental in sorting us out today. We also have our Ben Kitt consultant, consultants, Dr. Thompson and Dr. Fudge with us today. Please remember to complete our poll participation, participation poll. The link can be seen on this page. As a matter of fact, we also sent it along with the email inviting you to this session. Week one webinar. So let's get the ball rolling. We have our expert blended instructors here today, Dr. Glenda Gunter and Dr. Beth Young, both of whom are faculty at the University of Central Florida. Today is the first weekly webinar session for Blendkit 2016 as we wrap up week one. In week one, we focus on understanding blended learning. We want to look at a few feature pictures that we have. First, we see our group meeting last week for or planning for this week. We also have Byron, who is also a co-facilitator, traveling the globe with a blend kit flag moving from country to country, from zone to zone. And she stops in to meet a participant of blend kit 2015. We also have Dr. Fields, and she is practically showing off her badge that she recently got, and also showing where she is blending from at her school. We have another featured image here, and we welcome you to send your images to us for us to share. Another feature of individuals blending. So we welcome your photographs and your blend kit locations to ensure that we can share in the community. Email your photos to blendkit.edu or post your photographs to flickr.com and tag it blendkit. All right. So we have a learning community. As of today, we are over 1,400 in numbers. We are indeed developing a community of learners. You should use this opportunity and network with others across the globe. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to do that. As a matter of fact, our learning community is extensive, as shown in the blanket map that we have presented here. We have participants from Europe, North and South America, Australia, and the Caribbean, Asia, and Africa. We are off to a pretty good start, I think. And in the next week, five weeks, we will journey together as we explore blended learning. I want to touch a little bit on the assignments and badges. It looks like a lot of people are posting assignments over the weekend, and Bywin and I, along with a team of helpers, are catching up on grading the assignments. So I would advise you, don't panic if you haven't received a grade yet. Just stay calm. We're trying to work with the workload we're given here. We do have some poll that we would have asked you and we'll ask you to complete it as you go through. If you haven't replied yet, please do so. And for the others who will be listening to this recording, the poll will remain open. So I want us to have a brief overview of the poll. How many, and the first question or the first poll item was, how many times do you plan to allocate to the face-to-face -face portion of your blended learning course? And the results were, were, and I'm sure there will be more results coming in, more than 50% said, more than 50% of your course to blended learning, some said 17, and then less than 50% some individuals um, indicated that they would want less than 50%, and that indicator was 35%. And there was another poll. Which of the following course components do you plan to include in the face-to-face -face portion of your blended learning course? And of course, we said select all if apply. Some individuals said, and that was 55%, said lectures. Small group discussion was 82%. Quizzes, exam, 16%. People responded, and that's 28%. Assignments, submissions, 17%. Instructor question and answers, that would have been 73%. Others, 26 So we see some similarity here. And for poll three, which I'd like to discuss, 
indicated which of the following course components do you plan to include in the online portion of your blended course and of course you would have gotten the chance to select all so many of you intend to use your course as your, your blended part as content presentation and that was 80 percent discussion 75 percent quizzes would be 31 individuals that's 55 percent assignment submission 78 so we do see individuals critically thinking about how they're going to use these affordances of blended learning to ensure that they maximize the full potential of the design as we hear from our guest presenters today please listen to their thought processes in making decisions about how to blend the face-to-face -face and online elements and the need as the need of your course is presented. I'd like you to look or pay attention to the screen. We will start off the questions submitted by Google Docs from last week as a basis to moderate this mini panel discussion. During this discussion, please use the Q&A window indicated on the screen to clarify or ask questions to our panelists. We will do our best to fit a couple of questions into the session at the end. So let's get started. Please allow me to introduce to you Dr. Glenda Gunter and Dr. Beth Young, both of whom are from the University of Central Florida. Dr. Glenda Gunter is a national and international recognized authority on technology integration. Dr. Gunter is an associate professor and program coordinator of Educational Technology and E-Learning Program at the University of Central Florida. Dr. Beth Young is an Associate Professor of English at UCF and she has been teaching online since 2000. How I will ask the questions, I'll ask Dr. Gunter first and Dr. Beth Young will respond after. My first question to our panelists and thanks for making it to today. The nature of online communication has changed drastically over the past decade. Online work can be social, collaborative, as well as individual independent. How is this shift reflected in the development of blended learning models and practices? Dr. Gunther. Um, I actually really like this question because I've been teaching online since 1997 and when we started the whole movement was to go online 100% and what we've done is kind of backed up a little bit and looked at blended. I have always liked the models for blended because you get the best of all worlds and you're going to hear me say that more than once but what you can do on the online work is have very collaborative projects but what you can do in the blended part when you're face to face is back up all those questions, answers, and that little bit of extra social by being together. I do think that makes a difference and I heard the poll. You all have varying levels. I have taught from 20% to 50% to almost 70% blended and I will tell you whatever works for your content is the best. But you have to make sure you keep certain assignments that are very social and can be done online, which by the way, it's changed. You've got Google Hangouts, you've got Google Docs where students can work online and then collaborate in the class face to face. Thank you very much for that in-depth response. Dr. Young? Uh, this is an issue that I've been uh, wanting to, to uh, focus on ever since I started teaching online because from the beginning I was always afraid that I would end up with 40 independent studies as opposed to one class of students. So uh, it turns out that there are a lot of things you can do online just like with a face-to-face class that will help encourage them to engage with each other in ways that are appropriate. So things like online icebreakers, um, allowing them some informality in the online discussion. Sometimes I'll have discussion topics that are just dedicated to a more water cooler type chat. For example, if there's something in the news that relates to the topic, I'll bring it in and we can just talk about that, not for a grade. Um, and it's especially easy to get these kinds of online collaborations going when you have a blended environment because then the students are more likely to know who they're talking to. So uh, in order to encourage the social collaborative work online, I try to 
um, do what I can in the face-to-face -face class to help them put names with faces so that it's not so daunting when they're expressing an opinion um, just online. They know who is actually listening to them. Thank you very much. I love the cultural connection to the blended course design of which you spoke of. My question to you, I'm going to ask Dr. Young again, and then I'll go back to Dr. Gunter. What are your top three tips for instructors who are thinking of adapting a fully online course to a blended format? Well, going this direction from fully online to blended is my favorite way to develop a class. And in fact, even now when I'm teaching a brand new prep for a blended class, I try to think of it as online plus. I try to do what I can online, for, for example, turning things in online, and then I think of the class as a way to support the online things. So some of the questions that I consider when I'm trying to decide which thing are we going to do where, uh, first I try to consider which assignments are likely to need a lot of explanation or uh, some other kind of uh, ease into it and then I try to give a running start in the face-to-face -face portion. So for example there are some online assignments that I have that are quite a lot of work but students don't always realize that it's going to be a lot of work. They look at it and they think they plan to start working on the assignment a couple of hours before the deadline. So for those assignments, I try to build in some time in the face-to-face -face portion where they'll actually begin and get an idea of what's expected of them and be able to work together so that when they return to their computers later, they know what's going on and they're more likely to do it appropriately. I also try to figure out uh, which things would I really miss doing um, there are some activities, if I could figure out how to do them online, I'd do them in every class. So, for example, my students are learning the International Phonetic Alphabet, and I like to have a kind of a competition in teams where they, um, kind of like with a spelling bee, practice using the IPA. And I just can't figure out how to have a spelling bee kind of activity online. So I save those for the face-to-face -face class. And then finally, anything that I can do in a face-to-face -face class that will help students get to know each other better, I try to build that in also. So my top three tips are look for assignments that need a running start, do the things that you can't do online, and do the things that will help students interact face-to-face. -face. Wonderful. Dr. Gunther? I totally agree with Beth on those. Those are some of the best suggestions. One of I've, I've done this often, and I, I've moved to a fully online class, and I, like Beth, um, Dr. Young, got stuck in some assignments that just did not work online. And if I could figure a way, I also. But I found that that blended format made a difference. Um, we could actually do things that are so interactive, and, of course, my personality and their personality comes out. One of my suggestions, which is a kind of a instructor serious, is when I went from the online, everyone got confused about what, what assignments were online, what assignments were in class, and where were they supposed to be. So I started sending out, and I know it sounds silly, but I started sending out reminders. Remember, this is this type of class. Remember, we're going to be face to face. But what I found out even on my calendar, and it's worked very successfully, is I mark the dates. I change the lettering on the assignments where if it's a web assignment, it has a W in front of it. If it's in the classroom, it has an F in front of it. And I also did that for the sessions. I, that has eliminated the problem of getting confused. I also think, absolutely agree, that moving things from the online to blended, if you think about your assignments, there are some assignments that I was actually doing in a blended class that worked better online. Those are the things you think out prior, and it is amazing how you can flip a classroom. That's my best success, is I've been flipping my classroom that we spent two weeks online d learning all about video production and the product we were going to do, but once we got in class, the face-to-face, -face, we truly flipped it. We focused on the skills and running with it. So that was that was my two top, and the other I support what Dr. Young has said because they were excellent. Thank you. Some wonderful tips here. I'm going to go back to Dr. Gunter at this point. What are some common blended learning pitfalls we should do upfront so we can attempt to avoid them? I would say back to 
you need to make sure that you look at your own curriculum, your own content, and decide which direction you're going to go with what assignment. You need to do it up front. And uh, I've made a few mistakes myself, so you have to be very careful with making sure that type assignment can be flipped. And I will say we have to play with it a little bit. The other thing, and I brought this up, is the calendar. The calendar is a serious tool that I use very strongly that actually links to assignments because of the confusion. But a biggest pitfall I know is I had to learn that if assignment was online, it was graded and the feedback was online. If an assignment was in the class, the feedback went to them and we discussed it in class. I had to separate that for them. Now sure, you discuss some other assignments in class that are online, but it caused a, a a perfect line between letting the students know the difference in where we are and what we're doing. Thank you. Dr. Young? Yes, I completely agree with Dr. Gunter. One of the biggest problems is that it can be hard to integrate the two pieces of the class. And it's especially hard for some busy students. They tend to focus on either the online and think of the face-to-face -face as an afterthought, or they expect everything important will happen face to face and consider the online as an afterthought and then it's very easy to get confused about which things are happening when and where so I try to come up with a good principle that will help me keep straight what the difference is so for example this semester in one of my classes I've decided the face to face portion is where we're going to examine um, examples that will apply the concepts from our readings to and that's where I try to direct most of the face to face classes doesn't mean I don't do other things but when I have that principle in mind then it's easy for me to keep straight and it's also easy for me to make very clear how the face to face part relates to the online part and how the online part relates to the face-to-face -face part and when I can I'll write that into the assignment I will say specifically during the lecture we're doing this now because and that it helps me keep things straight and it helps students keep things straight the changing fonts idea is great I've tried that too and it works really well so some things are in all capital letters and some things are in lowercase letters in the printed materials and um, in general being very very organized so that you know before the semester starts which things you're doing where and why that will really help okay thank you very much based on time I'm going to ask the final question and then turn it over to Dr. Byron Chen who will take it on in your opinion how much time should the instructor design designate to, an to answering questions online should the instructor give the students a time frame for when he or she will be online? Um, well, I may not be the best role model, but what has worked for me the best is to just monitor the class very often and answer questions as soon as I can. I know sometimes my husband complains that I'm online all the time, um, but when I spoke to my colleagues at UCF, I ran some focus groups of people who were very experienced at online instruction, and they all said the same thing. Now, I don't feel any obligation to be available 24-7. I don't feel an obligation to answer questions at 10.45 at night. But I do like to pay attention to what's happening because sometimes there is a setting or something that I need to change, and the sooner I do it, the sooner students can get on with their work. Sometimes it's just a quick question that I can answer and then students can get on with their work. Sometimes a student sends me at one of those meltdown messages, my marriage is breaking up and I lost my job, um, and I'm not going to ignore that. So for what works for me best is to just, whenever I can, be aware when I've got questions coming in. All right, thank you. Dr. Gunter? Um, that is absolutely what I do. I found out real quickly that I couldn't be on 24-7. I did set some office hours where I was actually online and I thought it was kind of funny because I was usually the only one that ever showed up for that hour or two hours. I left it there for a whole semester but it, of course at the very end I had students but I found it's better. I just answer questions all the time but a strategy I came up with a, that I thought was it, it, it seems well the students said it, it really worked well for them I did like when I taught K through 12. I have a actual 
um, virtual coffee shop where the students can go in and talk to one another. And I tell them that Dr. Gunter is not judgmental, but that if someone else can answer your question first, just like I did in K through 12, ask a student first, then ask me. But I do monitor it and I can see when they're way off. It's also helped for collaboration between the students but it helps them then come back to me. Yes, I answer all their questions. And a lot of times if it's totally off in their virtual coffee shop, I post to the group, not in their area, but in the regular discussion and say, hey, I've been seeing this question quite often. I'm and I give them an answer. Things that are funny are the syllabus. They'll ask each other about questions about the syllabus and little things. But I have found that they do answer each other pretty well and it helps me guide the temperature of my class. Thank you very much. Based on time we could not ask another question so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bowen Chen at this point in time. Over to you Bowen. Thank you Rohan and thank you so much and Dr. Gunter and Dr. Yan and since uh, we lost some time at the very beginning of the session, I'm very sorry to say that we have to cut short the Q&A session. So we have some questions and comments on the Q&A board. And Rohan and I we will compile and forward those to uh, Dr. Gunter and Dr. Yan. And we'll try to get some responses back to you, to the group. And as we wrap up today's webinar, uh, we want to touch base on some housekeeping items. First, and while the majority of you have told us you are getting a lot out of Blend Kit 2016 and that you are clear on how to engage with the course, uh, we have received some comments indicating that some of you are having some issues to connect with Blend Kit 2016. And, and you're not sure on where to start. So this is an important issue worth addressing briefly in our time together here. Just a reminder and this is a professional development experience designed for flexibility and unlike the full credit college courses um, we are discussing here there are no mandated assignments or grades. It might be confusing to know uh, there is both a public website for Blend Kit 2016 and a Canvas course. If you are getting lost between these two sites stick to the Canvas course. Everything you need is in Canvas. The reason that you are seeing many of the course resources on the BlendKit website is so that these materials can be accessed once the course is closed. So make sure you bookmark the website outside of Canvas. When you are in Canvas, click on the modules link in the left menu. If you do not see the modules link, click on the three short lines on the top next to the course number. In, in the modules, the week's learning activities is the first item you will find under each weekly headings. You will also find an assignment for each activity. Remember, the activities are optional. It is up to you to select activities that meet your learning needs. We are also providing guidance to you in the weekly announcements, reminders, and again, the modules learning activities. If you have any questions, run into difficulties or you are just not sure how you can make the Blend Kit 2016 course work the best for you at any point, please message us in Canvas or email us at blendkit at ucf.edu. We would love to hear from you and see what we can do to help. Speaking of, um, um, speaking about hearing from you, the next slide is just talking about the emails and tweets we have seen throughout the week. Some of you asked, um, what do you need to do to complete the course? Remember, the level of participation is really up to you. You have to set your expectations. As far as readings go, we have module week one and two available. In the discussion area, we've got some great community going on. Um, please feel free to post in those areas. And also remember, you can create your own discussion topic. Uh, we have got a lot of discussions related with course design and definition of blended learning going on in the discussions area. If you are interested, head over to the discussion area and check those out. Also, the social networking, the participation is up to you. I know that we have participants who are using blogs and wikis and Twitter accounts. That is great. And some of you are not as active in those platforms. That is okay, too. You pick what is comfortable for you. We also um, give you the week one feedback form. 
we appreciate those who were able to fill that out. And here is some feedback we already received and appreciate. Um, most um, of you are finding readings and the DIY tasks the most helpful. A couple of comments we received um, about clarifications on how to start. So many stated that the orientation webinar helped clear that up. So please feel free to review that section of the webinar or send us an email and we would be happy to assist. And most stated it took between one to three hours to complete the week activities. Well, and um, grading, we are trying to provide feedback as timely as possible. Since week one is due today, we will be completing the grading for those activities as soon as possible. Some are submitting early and we are getting to those assessments as well, possible, as soon as possible. Uh, we now have uh, 1,431 participants. Please be more understanding to those numbers and know we are actively trying to interact through discussions, emails, and information streams. If we haven't interacted with you this past week, hopefully we will this week. And if you haven't yet completed the week one feedback form, I can't stress how valuable your input is. As I mentioned in our orientation session, this kind of open online course is something of a work in progress. It is far from perfect. Your feedback can help ensure that we meet the needs of all of our participants. The week one feedback form is available at this bit.ly link. This is a short URL that we created, but you can always access the feedback form inside the Canvas course under week uh, module one. We'll be providing you with feedback opportunities each week during the course. We are very excited to announce that so far we have about 30 local cohorts from different institutions registered during the Blend Kit 2016. Here is a list of institution names on the slide. If you are from one of the institutions but you haven't got a chance to connect with your cohort, feel free to contact us and we would be happy to get you connected with your point of contact person. It is still not too late to start your own institutional cohort. From our past experience, we've found that when you're in a cohort with local co colleagues, there's more of a sense of accountability and a greater sense that you'll actually take action on the good intention to use resources in BlendKit. And also, we will offer a customized blended learning consultation with cohorts that consist of 10 people or more. Towards the end of BlendKit, we'll we will also offer a webinar on what's next targeted to our local cohorts. And, but everybody, of course, in BlendKit is welcome to join the webinar. Later today, uh, you'll be receiving an announcement message from us with some guidance on getting the most out of week two. During week two, our focus will be on the interaction possibilities available in blended learning courses. And you will have the opportunity to receive some help in getting hands-on with making web versions of your course documents suitable for sharing with others online. As a reminder, if you'd like to proceed in a linear way through the course, you will probably find the module page and weekly table of contents helpful. And you may access the week two module via Canvas by clicking modules. You may also choose week two activities. You can also access from either the BlendKit schedule page or the learning activity pages on the external BlendKit site. In next week's webinar, we'll be joined by Dr. Daniel Fatasek from Oregon State University and Dr. Ida um, Mira Lee from Ohio State University. I hope you'll join us for that session. I'll pause here for a moment in case there are any other logistic questions or any issues anyone wants to raise that I have accidentally missed during today's session. Looks like we're good here. And just a reminder that and this webinar closes week one and we will be working in module two um, in, in the modules under week two this week. Again, and thank you so much for your participation in today's session. Again, we're sorry for the late at the very beginning and um, being late at the very beginning of the session. Thank you again for our um, guests, Dr. Glenda Gunter and Dr. Beth Young and also John Pizzo.
And don't forget to celebrate your accomplishments with Blend Kit 2016. And have a great week.